Hopefully I've got everything set up correctly. We'll see in another 10 seconds or so. Who's first? Nobody. No. Don't start before we start. Charlie, you did it. You're first. Good job. I was hoping it was you. <laughs> Mr. Reef Buster, you're second. Hey, Derek. Hello, everyone. Today's live stream is going to be about getting new fish. And I think that's a timely one. Uh, it was Caitlin's recommendation, and I like it because we're about to get some new fish next week. We've mentioned to you last week what was going on, but I wanted to uh, go into a little bit more information about what to consider and how to plan ahead. And it will help you in the long term if you heed this amazing advice. Uh, I did want to show you guys the angler in real light. Uh, last, this is what I wore last weekend, and it's pretty cool. And uh, a lot of people asked me where it came from. It was Halloween, HalloweenCostumes.com. So this was, we thought it would be way cooler work in the dark for that live stream, so we did. And uh, this is fun. I liked the little light the whole time. So yes. it'll be a year from now before we use it again. <laughs> that one's not for you, Jack. But you can have a squash. <laughs> nope, not for you. Get down. Good girl. All right. So uh, when we're talking about getting new fish, we need to think ahead. We want to know what we're going to get before we're at the fish store. And unfortunately, a lot of us, and myself included, would see something and then we would just say, I don't care what that costs, I'm, I'm buying it. <laughs> Bag it up, let's go. And then you get home, you're thinking, well, was this a good choice? Did I take a risk? So really what you should be doing is as you plan your tank, you should plan what fish you want to get and hopefully plan to get the fish in the correct order because some fish are going to be very, very friendly. Others are going to be a lot more temperamental. Some are going to be very uh, right aggressive. And so we want to add the aggressive fish last when the entire reef has been established and every little fish has found their hidey home. So when the big mean one goes in, in theory, hopefully, there will be peace in the tank. But that's not guaranteed. So we want to keep that in mind. Now, the, the best advice you'll ever get from anyone is going to be research, research, research. So if you are trying to pick fish for your tank, Research doesn't mean go into a Facebook group and just say, I'm thinking about getting 10 fish, what do you think? That's not research, that's an opinion. <laughs> and you will get probably nine different opinions if nine people reply. And instead what we want to do is we want to actually read up on each fish, find out what their needs are, find out what their compatibility is, and that way when you do acquire these fish, like I said before, hopefully they'll all get along and you'll have zero losses. Because we are not buying fish just to lose them, we're buying them to keep them for many, many years because we think they're beautiful. Something that you may not have thought about when you're considering what fish to buy is what color they are. And a lot of times when you look at a reef tank, you'll see all these fish and you'll see all these corals, but then you'll realize something's missing. Like there's no yellow in the tank. And you're like, if I only had a yellow fish, and so you start researching what fish are yellow. Or you might say, I really would like to see a bright blue fish. And then you have to debate dark blue, light blue. You've got the hippo tang and you've got the powder blue tang. There's totally different looks and they add a lot of pizzazz to your tank, which is something that we want. But if you end up with all the same color, it may be a little bit drab. And so you want to be able to figure out what color you're looking for and then hopefully find a fish that will get along with the rest of your fish. Like for example, you might find the perfect color angler, but it would just eat all your fish. <laughs> and then you'd be down to one fish again. So we don't want that to happen. We want to have something that's going to work and something that's going to be pretty, uh, something that is uh, not going to bite you when you put your hand in the tank to work in there. We want to get everything. We, that's why we're doing the research. You want to find out where they're from. You want to uh, find out the person selling if they're a reliable seller. Uh, like I told you last week, my order that was placed with the live Aquarius Divers Den, they've been around a very long time. I don't even know. I would say at least 15 years. Uh, you know, if you're trying to figure out that ideal fish, you go to Diver's Den because they have the dream fish there. And some of those may be so expensive you can't possibly afford them, but it is fun to dream. And we do like to have um, uh, imaginations from time to time of what would look nice. But uh, like, for example, I would love the peppermint angelfish, but I have no tank to put it in. 
uh, I can't afford it. It would take at least three credit cards to buy it. <laughs> and then if it were not to make it for some reason, I'd still owe three credit cards, and that would be really, really bad. Uh, when you're doing your research, you want to go to multiple websites. Try not to go to just one. If you can get your hand on some books, that would be smart as well. The uh, There's a... Uh, one book about fish, I think it's by Michael Paletta, that is a good one to add to your collection. Um, I'm sure you'll find several different choices on Amazon these days. There are some books that are actually uh, designed for scuba divers so they can identify the fish they see when they're swimming in various parts of the world. And so you may be able to look up by zone, like what's in Fiji, what's in uh, uh, you know, just Hawaii, or different areas that you might want to fish from. You could find out what is there to kind of maybe hone in on the ideal fish that you think would be really nice. We also want to research, will your habitat support that fish? Can it, will it stay in the tank or will it jump out? Do you have to have a screen on top? A lot of people just by default put a screen on top. And of course, with that being there, that doesn't guarantee the fish won't get out. And there's so many stories of people that have just the slightest little gap in one little spot and a fish jumped out and it's lying dead on top of the screen because it eluded it and couldn't get back into the water. Now, my tank's been open top for many years, and now that I'm getting these little firefish, I'm looking to get some screens. Just one sec. Can't see it. I'm getting cue cards. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I'm just going to read this to you. Dreamfish don't have to be expensive. I love yellow goatfish. They're not expensive, but they get huge. Goatfish are kind of cool looking, but I've never seen one in a person's tank. Yeah, they have whiskers to work through the sand bed. But I usually only see those in public aquariums, probably because of the size they become. We uh, want to also keep in mind that when you do get something and you've done the research and you think you know what it's going to do, the fish may not act the same as was predicted because those fish don't read the same books we do. And so they may not even understand or realize they're not supposed to do something that you read about that they would never do and they're totally doing it. Like, for example... You may read about the hippo tank, for example, the royal blue regal, and you might say, oh, I, I really like this fish, and I've read about it, and it's great, and then you discover it moves things around your tank. And you say, well, that's not in any of the stuff I've read. Well, it's something that sometimes happens. Sometimes they like to rearrange the reef a little bit, and they will pick up that expensive zoanthid, carry it in the tank, and drop it behind the rock work, and that's it. It's gone. And you may find all kinds of treasure in the back of your rock work because of that one fish that moves things that was unexpected. So putting gluing things in place and using putty to fix them may work but the fish may still uproot it and yank it out and or actually just eat it <laughs> that sometimes happens from time to time as well so we want to do our research and like i said we want to know in the order they're going to go into the aquarium so that way you don't put in anything too soon that messes up the hierarchy that's going on in the tank in the coming months as you acquire more fish so if you were trying to buy, like, let's say nine fish for your aquarium, and you knew the most troublesome fish, or the, the troublemaker, is going to go in last, I would not start shopping for that right now. I wouldn't even think about that fish right now. That's going to be way later. And then even if you are ready to get it, you know, you've done your work, you've put in all the first fish, and now you're ready for that one, you can't find it, that's okay. There's no rush. You can get it whenever. Whenever it becomes available, you could let your fish store know, or a few fish stores know, you're looking for this fish, and see if anyone can get it for you. Or you contact Live Aquaria directly on the phone and say, I'm looking for this fish. What can you do? And perhaps they can do that. And there's other vendors as well. That's just the one I like to use. But if you are, don't, there's no deadline on a reef tank. It's a hobby that goes on and on and on. You know, the whole saying, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. We will get that fish whenever we get that fish. And if you stumble on something early on and you're like, oh, I don't want to miss out, just miss out. <laughs> it's so much better to not get it now. Take care of your reef. Make sure everything's stable. Make sure everything's going well. Acquire the rest of the little fish that I call timid or reef safe that are just docile. Grab those and put them in the tank first. And then eventually you'll get the one that could be semi-aggressive, which might be a purple tang. Uh, it could be a sohal tang. A lot of times tangs are aggressive. Um, there's... Some wrasses are really aggressive. Like, let's say you really want a blood shrimp and a cleaner shrimp, but then that prohibits you from getting certain wrasses that you might really want to buy. So what do you do? You enjoy the cleaner shrimp, and you enjoy the blood shrimp, and you enjoy the peppermint shrimp, 
and you don't get that wrasse for a while, but then one day you finally say, I'm ready for the wrasse, and I don't care what happens to those shrimp. If that's how you feel at that point, and they just become expensive meals, you're not going to regret it. You're not going to miss it. You're just going to move on with your life. I can't see it. It's too far away. <laughs> I'm still getting more cue cards. <laughs> you know, if you keep this up, I'm just going to put you on the stream. <laughs> okay, here's the advice from the fish girl. If your dream fish is a bastard, he should go in last. Don't buy the first one you see, and respect territory size and hardiness. Good tips. You could have said that. I know. <laughs> Today's her off day. It's Saturday. She doesn't understand. This is when we worked. All right. Um, now, we've decided what to buy. We're going the right order. Now we finally buy it. You want to buy it from someone you can trust. I mentioned Live Aquaria. You may find that your local fish store is who you trust the most. That's totally fine. Wherever you feel comfortable shopping, as long as it's going well, don't stop what you're doing. Don't change because you saw me talk about something on YouTube. If you like your, your fish store owner and he's getting you uh, the fish that you, he or she's getting the fish that you like, then just keep going with that if that's what's working out for you. If you go to a store and it seems like everything you're buying is not making it, it's time to look for a different store. Something's just not right in the chain of handling, the custody. It's just not going well and you're buying a fish and it lasts, lasts a week or two. And let's just assume you're doing everything correctly, but it still doesn't make it. Something's happening. Either there's a problem with the fish in the first place, that they just don't do well from that store. Uh, there's a problem with the acclimation process. There's a problem with the quarantine slash medication. Uh, there is a problem with the tank itself. And so we want to rule out all the possibilities where it can go wrong. For me, if I buy fish from one store and they historically die, I just stop buying fish from that store. I'll buy from other stores. And uh, <laughs> that actually works. <laughs> so, like I said, I don't know what's happening at one store, but it's like, I just, I'm not going to buy fish. I'll still buy corals, I'll buy test kits, I'll buy fish food. But fish, I won't take the chance because it's just like throwing away money. And it's not fair to the fish either. I'm just like, you know what? This just this store can't do for me what I need. It's just like going to a restaurant. If you're not happy with the food, you go to a different restaurant. Okay? So if you can do those things, if you can find someone that you trust and shop from them and do business with them and build a good rapport, they may even help you get those things that are difficult to acquire. Um, and you can just say, look, I'm looking for this fish. There's no rush. Um, but if you'll put me down on your list and keep me in mind and let me know what you find out and let me know what it's going to cost, that would be great. Now, if you do buy a fish impulsively, like I did many years ago, I walked into a fish store here in Fort Worth and I saw a flame angel and I just said, I don't care what that costs, put it in a bag. And I brought it home. And I was so excited to get this flame angel. It was beautiful. Man, the color was spectacular. It was eating in the store. I, I was super excited. And I had that fish for many, many years. But if you buy something impulsively and then just drop it in your tank, no quarantine, no knowledge, a lot of things can go wrong, including the loss of that fish or the loss of other fish. So you really do need to know what you're buying and how they interact with others and you know, kind of put on the brakes. Uh, there's even a time where I have in the past went into a fish store and said, I want that fish. I'll even pay for it, but I don't want you to bag it up. I'll come back in a day or two. I want to go home and do my research. And... If the store owner is amenable to that and they say yes, that's fine, then great. If they say no, we don't hold fish or you know, we're not gonna give your money back, you know, then that's a whole other argument. But that was my approach. I wanted to know more about it. I didn't know anything about it. So I went home, I did my homework, and then I came back the next day. I said, Yep, we're good to go. Please bag it up, and I got my new fish. And that was really nice, and uh, I was very excited and it went well. But uh it, yeah, so the reason for you putting down money is so that they don't sell it to someone else. But if you, let's say, for example, you're a regular, you come to the store every single week and every single week you say, hey, I want you to hold that fish for me. And then you don't buy it. They probably won't do it. You know, it's one thing to ask for an, a favor or an occasional thing. But if you're regularly changing your mind at the last minute, you're actually inhibiting them from selling to others because you're basically holding it. You're reserving the spot. And so someone else walks in ready to buy that fish and they can't because there's only one. So you want to also be fair to other uh, buyers by not... Uh, hoarding <laughs> that fish, so to speak, just because you might buy it. So that's something, you know, that's going to be a matter of politeness and also a relationship you've built up with the vendor. So if you can do that, I think you'll, uh, you'll find that things go really well that direction. And they also respect you for wanting to do more homework rather than just buying. At least I would like to think that. 
Now, once you get your fish and you, whether it comes delivered to you or you bought it from the fish store, the first thing you have to do, the first thing is acclimate. Now, if you are buying things online, I highly, highly urge you do not have them shipped to you something on Thursday to arrive on Friday. I, matter of fact, don't ship things when it's freezing cold or blazing hot, but avoid weekend deliveries because invariably something will go wrong for whatever reason somewhere between leaving the facility and coming to your house where the box does not get delivered that day. You're losing your mind. Your hair is on fire. You're calling FedEx, UPS, DHL, whoever it is, and you're screaming at them, it's alive, you have to do this, and they really don't care. To them, it's one more box out of a billion boxes. And so demanding to talk to their manager, <laughs> it's not going to work. You may occasionally get someone that cares. Maybe they are a fish keeper themselves. But invariably, it's just don't deliver into the weekend because if they don't bring it on Friday, it's a good chance you won't see it till Monday or even possibly Tuesday. And by then, whatever it was is definitely going to be dead. So I always recommend you get things that are shipped to you on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. And those three days, I think, are ideal. They can leave on Monday, be there Tuesday. Be on Tuesday, be there Wednesday. Leave on Wednesday, be there Thursday. Forget Fridays. And Monday won't happen because they never ship on Sundays. So Tuesday to Thursday are the ideal days for deliveries. And uh, if you cannot be there when the box arrives, and that's something else, like I mentioned before, but the weather. If they deliver the box and you're still at work until 5 o'clock and it's sitting in full sunlight by the front door, the box could be getting really, really hot. Um, or it could be dead of winter and it's freezing cold and the wind is blowing and the box is leaking for whatever reason and your livestock is not doing well. The other thing that I like to do with livestock, and I've done it in the past with several vendors, is I had them deliver to the local FedEx Kinkos. And what they do is they ship at that, you know, let's say Monday night. It goes out at 6 p.m. And it's at FedEx Kinko's at 9 a.m. And I can be there at 9.01 and get my box. So it's actually the least amount of time versus it being on a truck for half the day till they finally get here at 3 in the afternoon or something. So I do like the idea of holding it at the closest FedEx Kinko's if that's a possibility for you. And I find that's great because you can, if you're a person that has to go to work, you know, 9 to 5, and you're literally going to an office, you can say, look, I can't come in until 10 <laughs> or 11. Um, and you can say whatever you want. You can say, I'm getting a new fish. You can send one to the doctor. I don't care what you say. But you can get to the place, pick up your box, come home, acclimate, and then go to work. So that would be my recommendation rather than taking a chance. Some people have it delivered to their place of work. And that way they just get the box. And if they're in a place with a cubicle, they shove it under the desk. And at the end of the day, they take their box. And they don't even open it until they get home. And that way the temperature within is trapped and it can't get too cold or too warm while you're waiting for it to get home. But once it's home, you have to acclimate it, and you have to acclimate, acclimate it properly. And a lot of companies will usually tell you how to acclimate. They'll be very specific. Do this, do this, do this. If anything's wrong, take pictures, notify us within this many hours. We need proof, we need photographs. You know, I mean, the whole thing, especially if you're trying to make a file a claim. But let's just assume everything's going perfectly, and you've read the instructions really quickly of what they said you're supposed to do, and you proceed. The one thing I feel some hobbyists make a big, big mistake on is they say, I've been acclimating this way for 10 years. I'm not going to follow their stupid system. And then when something goes wrong, they say, well, I know what I'm doing. And the vendor thinks, well, I can't help you because you didn't follow my guidelines. And they have guidelines for a reason. They, they want you to be successful. They do not want you to file claims and complain and write bad things about them on Facebook or wherever. They want you to get that fish. They want you to be happy. They want you to buy more fish in the future. So if you will at least read over their review and review their acclimation principles, they probably have them on the website before you even receive your delivery, which would give you plenty of time to call or email them and say, why are you saying to do this? Because I've always done this and see what they say. And if they explain it and it's logical, then why not try what they're recommending? So that way, if anything goes wrong, you can say, yes, I received it on time. I did what you asked. The fish just didn't make it. I need to file a claim. It's a lot less of an argument, and there's no threats being exchanged. There's no, no anger. Instead, you're just getting the problem resolved, and you can move forward with your life. <laughs> and I think that would be the best approach. But uh, in general, I like to acclimate fish myself, just talking about when I go to a fish store and I buy and I come home. There's no rule of acclimation for my fish store. I like to get the fish into the water in about 45 minutes or so, maybe 50 minutes. And in general, I float the bag for about 10, 
minutes or so, and then I open it up and I make sure that the water can't pour out from the bag into my system. And I'll add a small amount of water into the bag every seven minutes. And I set the timer on my watch and every seven minutes my watch vibrates and I go ahead and I tap it, you know, hit resume, you know, to do it again and again and again. And I pour some water in the bag and I keep pouring it in. And in general, I'm trying to double the water volume in the bag. And then from that point, it has, you have to do something else. Now, a lot of people would put it into a quarantine tank, but I know a ton of you don't do that. And I haven't had a quarantine tank in 10 years. So I, um, I totally understand where you're coming from and I'm not judging you whatsoever. I have been using something called Safety Stop that I have a video about on this channel. It's from Blue Life USA. And this is a two part bath that takes 45 minutes per part for your new fish. So actually the acclimation and then going through Safety Stop takes about two hours for me from top to bottom to get to complete the task, maybe even two and a half hours. And then I put my fish into the Peacemaker and it sits inside the tank for several days, usually about three days, 72 hours, and then I can pour it into the reef and not have any aggression. So here is my own personal Peacemaker. It's a large acrylic box, has a lot of holes drilled in it. I haven't used it in a while, but we're gonna use it next Tuesday. And it's got a lid. <laughs> I'm going to. Uh, so this is the lid that keeps the fish from jumping out while it's in the box. And when the fish is inside there, the other fish can swim up and look at it. It can look back, but there's no squabbling, there's no fighting, there's no territorial disputes. And when you get a brand new fish, it's very stressed. It just went through handling, it went through netting, it went through safety stop, and it's, res it's uh, exuding this hormone or this, uh, yeah, I'd say it's a hormone, into the water that says, I am stressed as can be. And the other fish are instantly pushed into aggression mode and they want to fight. They're looking for a fight. So putting it in this box, it can dissipate that aggression. The other fish don't know what to fight with because it seems everything's normal, but they smell it, but they still don't fight each other because they know each other. And the new guy, they can't interact with. And then after the three days, I can just take the box and I can just lift it out of the water and pour the fish in. And I have no aggression. And this has worked for 10 years. So I recommend it. And uh, for the smaller tank, for the anemone cube right over here, Caitlin is going to build a small peacemaker probably on Sunday or Monday. And we're going to, and if it comes out well, <laughs> we'll make more of them to sell in the shop. But uh, yeah, if it's a terrible idea, we won't do it. But no, I, I think we should make a smaller one anyway. So that way you can have that for smaller tanks and they'll be available on Miller's Reef when we get some made. But uh, the peacemaker is super beneficial for a person that does not quarantine. If you prefer to quarantine, definitely go from safety stop straight into a quarantine tank to observe that fish for about 21 days. You feed the tank every single day, maybe a couple times a day, maybe several times a day. And then after you're done feeding, within two or three minutes, you should siphon out all the food from the bottom of the quarantine tank so that that water doesn't become toxic. Any food that's sitting in the bottom that hasn't been eaten will not be eaten later by the fish. It'll just break down, it'll rot, it'll raise the ammonia level, which burns the gills of the new fish. And now the new fish is in trouble because of bad husbandry. So you have your quarantine tank set up, you've got a filter hanging on the back, you drop in food, you watch the fish eat, then within a few minutes you siphon out that food and you do a 10% water change every single day on that tank. So it's a little bit of effort, but the benefit is that you can actually see if the fish is gonna break out into some kind of disease way before it's in your main tank so that you don't infect all the healthy fish in your tank with the new guy. So that's why quarantine is so important and that's why all public aquariums definitely quarantine they quarantine everything. And they will quarantine their fish or corals for a minimum of 45 days. And if they somehow end up receiving more livestock and have to put it into that same trough or vat with the stuff that was already in the countdown, they reset the clock and start day one to 45 days again. And so they could have stuff in there for nine, you know, for, I was gonna say 90 days, if suddenly they received something that was impounded, for example, that was shipped illegally. And then, you know, I guess TSA or whoever, uh, Fish and Wildlife contacts the public aquarium and says, hey, we've got this shipment of corals. Do you have room? Can you take these? And uh, they usually say yes, and then they try to figure out where to put them. <laughs> but like I said, if they have to put those in a system that was about to be released, they have to reset the clock, and they have to watch everything and observe it and dip and study and look for any kind of parasites, look for anything on the fish. And then eventually they get to go in their ecosystems where everyone can appreciate them. So it can be a very long time waiting for something on your tank, but having the disease get into your tank and attack your fish and make them all sick and even lose some. Like for example, I remember years ago, I had got some anthias and they were beautiful and they were gorgeous. And I was like, oh man, I wish I had more. 
And so I got some more. And of the ones I bought, only one survived. The others died. And then three of my healthy ones died. And I thought, why did I even bother? I should have just left it alone because I had some healthy fish in there. And now I've got less than what I started with, and I lost money. So it was kind of a uh, frustrating moment. Uh, what to feed the fish that you've just recently received would be probably whatever you normally use. But you can always ask the vendor you're buying from, what do you feed these fish? And if you're there to see it in person and you watch them feed that fish something, you can say, I want some of that to go. And so you buy your fish and you buy that food and you come home with it. And whether it's going into your system or it's going into the quarantine tank, you have the food that fish was eating in front of you visibly. And you'll know that you're not going to have a skinny fish that starves to death because it found something it likes. You can always, I, I know sometimes people say, hey, I bought this fish and I've tried everything which we know isn't true. <laughs> what they've tried is everything they have. But uh, you can always try flake food. You can try pellet food. You can try frozen food that's been thawed out. You can try terrestrial food, terrestrial plants. You can try meaty foods such as open clams that you got from the market, shrimp, uh, octopus, squid, anything like that. Any, just try it all. Brine shrimp, uh, black worms are another popular one. Blood worms are usually available everywhere but frozen. So you have a lot of choices. And then there's, of course, nori. And then, you know me, banana. <laughs> but you can try a lot of different things until you find the right thing. And if you are having problems finding the right thing, you can ask others, what else could you think of? And they'll give you advice, and you buy it, and you use it. And you don't sit there and think, well, I have these three things. That's your choices. That's not how the fish work. They are going to be particular about their diet. They may even be picky. They may be moody. They may be stressed and wouldn't want to eat even if they love that food. And that happens, too. So your quarantine tank should have something in it for the fish to duck into for cover and to feel safe so they're not just constantly on display in a glass rectangle. They should have either some rock or some PVC pipe or some kind of ornaments or, I don't know, maybe even plastic plants if that's your thing. Just something that the fish can duck into and feel kind of like, okay, this is home. I'm, I, I can duck here and feel safe from that scary human that keeps walking toward me. You know, you could consider something rather than just a bare bottom tank. And uh, that way, the fish can kind of relax and hopefully jump into eating. And the more it eats, the better. Because when it goes into your tank, it's nice and fat. It's not a thin, weakened, emaciated fish that is struggling to survive and barely made it out of your quarantine. We want that quarantine tank is the perfect time to fatten up a fish because it's eating with zero com competition. So that fish that's in there, it can eat all the food as often as you want to give it to it. And it will, obviously, if you fed it every single hour, it's not going to work because the fish is full. It's not going to eat. But if you fed two, three, four, five times a day, little tiny amounts, and it kept gobbling it up and gobbling it up, that's great. And that way you know that you've got a, a fish that has a decent immune system when it enters the main tank. Okay? And then when it comes to introduction, uh, like I said, I use the Peacemaker, but others will just take the net <laughs> and they will just put it in the tank. And I feel like if you're going to do that approach, which I understand why you would do it, I would prefer that you do it later in the evening or turn the lights off on the tank entirely. And that way, most of the fish go into their hidey holes. The new guy goes in. It swims around. It's looking for different spots that it could call home. The, the, the reef dwellers will kind of defend their territories, and they'll figure out. It'll find a spot, hopefully, that it can call its own little nook. But uh, we, if you just drop it into a tank full of light, you might have a lot of fighting because everything's normal, new guy shows up, and so everyone's aching for a fight. And we don't want to do that. So by killing the lights in the room, killing lights in the tank, that can help. Um, dropping food in the tank first so the fish are fed before you put the new guy in is another trick that could kind of reduce aggression because they're not hungry and looking for you know, something to chomp on. <laughs> So we want to keep that one in mind as well. Um, I think that pretty much covers what it is when it comes to buying new fish. So at this point, I would like to switch to a different thing that happened yesterday, in fact. I've had the uh, Eheim auto feeder on my tanks for years. And every once in a while, one will just start spinning and dumping food into the tank. And I think what, why it does that is the battery has gotten so low, but it's not enough to stop it. It's enough to keep it going, which is crazy. I'd rather just not run. But what I saw was some flake food going into the tank, and I thought, oh, okay, the fish are eating. 
And then I don't know what time it was when I saw it again, but I was like, it's still dropping flake food. And I just looked up and the drum was just spinning and spinning. And when I look on the display where the numbers are, it was blank. Like divert all power from here to the life support and just send it all into the pellet part and just dump food, dump food, dump food. So of course I removed it immediately from the tank. There's pellet or flake food going everywhere. And uh, I didn't bother trying to scoop it out. That's something you can do if, like, let's say, for example, you have a child or a grandchild or a pet that knocks a jar of fish food into your aquarium and food just goes everywhere and it looks like New Year's Eve with all the confetti. You can definitely take a fishnet and kind of sieve the tank, try to catch and remove as much as possible. But in my case, this stuff was tiny. It wasn't thousands of flakes. It was just was flakes were everywhere. And I just knew, well, they'll, they'll eat what they can. The rest will land on the sand or it'll land on the rock, and that's it. I can't do anything about it. And so a few hours later, I tested the water. Uh, phosphates were 0.75, and nitrate was um, 45 or 50. So I, that's because all that food dumped in the tank. So last night, I removed the Clarice, and I put in my little sock box. That's my modular thing, and I put in a 5 micron sock. And uh, I had the protein skimmer, and I cleaned the protein skimmer completely. Uh, I mean, you know, the cup and the neck. I didn't remove the the body. And I then waited for lights out, and I put in my phosphate RX, which is this stuff that I've been recommending for more than a decade because I've been using it for more than a decade. This is an additive you put in. It's lanthanum chloride that is uh, mixed to the proper amount, and you count the drops. And I just put in, I think I put in 220 drops last night. I haven't tested yet today, but overnight the water was cloudy initially. I, when I looked in here, it was just like, milky white sort of not milk but you know really cloudy and uh, I watched my fish I watched in specifically the yellow tangs I watched them they're swimming around like no big deal we've done this 50 times before we don't care so I know some people lose yellow tangs with that product I do not know why but I have two yellow tangs I've been in it for seven years and uh, they go through it four or five six times a year anyway I did it last night and today when I got up the tank was crystal clear I also cleaned out my reactor with uh, used carbon and I filled up with fresh carbon, which I rinsed. I set the reactor in the sump and I added some water so the reactor wouldn't float. And I set it exactly where it needs to be in the, uh, in the sump in its one spot. And that way I don't have to worry about it bobbing or falling over or doing anything, but I didn't add any more water. I didn't let it run yet. I didn't want to run carbon during the phosphate RX because it just seemed like I would clog up the sponges in the reactor with lanthanum. So instead I waited till this morning and around 10 o'clock when I got up, I went ahead and I checked on the tank, water was clear, and I went ahead and I opened the valve to send water into the reactor for the granulated activated carbon or GAC, G-A-C. And uh, now the water is getting more and more clear. Actually the tank looks fantastic right now, even though you can't tell on the live stream, but it, it, the water is really, really pretty. And tomorrow it's gonna be incredible. Uh, later today, Caitlin and I are going to work on cleaning the sand bed because next Tuesday is the seven year anniversary of the reef tank and the anemone cube. So we want both those tanks to be pristine for a nice video where I'll do an entire review of the system and show you everything and how it ticks, and uh, which I do every single year. So that is exciting. And then on Tuesday, our new fish arrive from Diver's Den and they are gonna go through Safety Stop and then they're gonna go into two different peacemakers to get ready for going into their tanks a few days later. So that is kind of an update on the tanks, uh, what's going on there. And now I want to talk to you about new products. So a couple I mentioned last week, so I'm just gonna repeat it because, because it's my channel. <laughs> so this is a new product from Aquaspin. And actually I'm gonna switch cameras here because I brought a second camera today. So this is the one from Aquaspin. It's a little uh, magnetic stirrer. It uses a USB wire to charge it. So you don't have to worry about um, putting batteries in it on a regular basis. And I haven't, I need to open one up and use one, but I have no doubt it's exactly what, what we want and it's great for doing your water tests. So the Aquaspin, I promised a week ago to be on the website. It's not there yet, but it will be soon. Also, uh, this came in this week. This is the newest version of Coral Magazine. It's about worms and it's about bubble tip anemones and it's about psychedelic mandarins. So if you don't have this issue, if you're not a subscriber, I have six issues available and this could be added to your next order. So it's included, or I can just ship just this all by itself to you. And then Flipper sent me some new stuff. So this is their Deep Sea Max magnified viewer. And I've had one, but the problem with mine is that it kept sliding down the glass because it's so big 
this part here is a five inch magnifying glass that it would slide down the glass and it was kind of a bummer and so I didn't want to say anything negative so I said nothing at all and then they contacted me and said we've sent out a new and improved version and I thought well it looks like what I have and then I found this inside the package and I was super excited so I didn't do it yet I wanted to save it for the live stream and I hope I can do it on camera but you've got this magnet this part here will go inside the tank it's got fuzzy stuff on one side and it's hard plastic on the other the magnet sealed inside and then this part will go on the outside of the tank. And see, you can see my beard, oh my God. And then right here it's fuzzy, but this is why it was sliding down the glass because it was just, I'd hang it there and five minutes later it would be way down here. And then finally it's down by the sand, which is no fun. So it turns out what they've done with this new one, and if you already own this Deep Sea Max, you can get this rubber pad from them. That was the first question I said, well, what about the people that bought one already? So this is a textured rubber pad, looks like a neoprene, and it's got sticky stuff on the back, and this is gonna go on the outside of the tank. So you don't have to worry about doing a bad job, but you're required to remove this felt stuff. See, I said I'm gonna try this on camera, probably won't have much luck. Let's see if I can peel this off. Oh, good. So it's really on there, but the felt stuff would be so you could slide around the glass and not risk scratching your tank, right? But if the thing is too heavy for your tank, using this rubber piece will solve the problem because it gives it traction on the glass. This is really holding on well. I'll show you guys what I'm doing. So I've peeled off this much so far. Back up a little bit. And then we'll try it out. But I have big hopes this is going to work great. And my first thought was, well, where are we going to get these rubber pads for everyone that has one? So I was really glad that they're doing it. So all the new ones going out now will include it. They basically did like a, um, not a recall, but an update. So I'm removing the leftover glue here. That was pretty good. So now it's been cleaned off. And then this piece is going to stick right here. I'm going to stick it on the tank. Perfect. So there's our new rubber traction. Here's our piece that goes inside the tank. Nice. Ooh, that stays really well. Okay. So I can still move it. Cool. We'll leave it up here just to show that it sticks. <laughs> okay. Then I'm gonna put this back on here for now. Then they came out with something new. This guy right here. So you know how we have our tanks with a lot of blue light and it's hard to see your corals. So they've released an orange filter made specifically for the five inch deep sea. And who knows? Maybe they'll have them for the smaller ones as well. We'll see. You just take it and you press it right in. And now it's on there permanently. And you can look at things in your tank with blue lighting. And you'll be able to see your livestock a little bit better. So that's pretty cool. And I tried it out last night. I walked around the tank with my phone and the orange thing. And I was like, oh, it's not bad at all. And they also sent out a new Flipper Max. Or, I'm sorry. Yeah. Flipper Max, but this one floats. And this I haven't even opened yet, so we're gonna open it on camera like I told him I would do. So I'll show it to everyone on the live stream and he just sent me back a smiley face. So inside here, obviously your instructions. There is a plastic scraper that is designed for acrylic tanks. So that'll have little teeth on it. And then 
you have two halves here. Got to keep everything separate. So this is the part that goes outside, gives a nice handle. This is the part that goes inside the tank. Oh, and there was a spacer in there. That was just to keep them apart so you can get them separated. Because you know the general rule of thumb, don't put them near each other. Now, the flipper cleaner is designed to actually be in your tank one way, or you can twist this and it will literally flip itself over <laughs> and use the soft scrubby pad to clean the glass instead of the blade. And uh, so this one's designed, it feels very light compared to the one I've done before. So this would be great for working your tank, and if they were to be separated, it should flow to the surface. I'll let you know how that goes. But that is a, a new product that just came out. That's exciting. And there's still more. Finally, this little guy here. So this is the flipper feeding kit. And it's designed with two different choices. So you've got a clip that has Velcro on it where it will stick to the inner piece that's in the tank. So you've got your feeding, your I'm sorry, you've got your glass cleaner on the glass and then you want to feed, you can now affix one of these two items directly to the cleaning magnet and move it where you want it and the fish can eat. This one here is a feeding cup where you put food inside it and then the holes would be in the base there where the food can come out and drizzle into the tank for the fish to peck at it. And it also has a little strip of Velcro on it. So both these are Velcro and they will attach to the magnet itself and that way you can put them anywhere you want in the tank and it probably will work with all three sizes of the cleaning magnets, the Nano, the Standard, and the Max. So I want to show you all those new things because that's pretty cool. And I've been waiting days to open those up because <laughs> I want to open them up on camera. All right, what else? I think that was all our new stuff for today. So you know. Yep, I talked about all that. All right, let's switch back. So now what I'll do is I will play our movie. This was from last week. I was going to release it. I was going to release this video on the YouTube channel just the way it is with some narration. I just haven't had any time to do it. But uh, I just want to show you some close-ups of the tank from, this was filmed the night before thing, uh, before Halloween. So I'm going to put that on there. I'm going to throw myself in a picture-in-picture, picture, I hope. If I can remember how to do that again. There we are. And one second here. There we go. Oh, actually, I'll put myself in the corner up here. And then we'll start putting your questions on here and start answering them. If you haven't asked any questions yet on this channel before, all you do is type at Milo's Reef and then type your question. And that way I will be able to find it in the conversation because a lot of you like to talk. And so that way I don't overlook you accidentally. Um, Thomas Miller says... Hey Mark, a reefer about an hour away has a Nubo 70 gallon drop off tank that looks very interesting. Any thoughts? Well, you should go check it out. And if it's good price and you like it and you want to add it to your life, you should do it. Oh, I got a, a thing coming up for you, by the way. So let me answer this. No, you know what? I'll tell you first. So my friend Aaron, who grows beautiful SPS corals, uh, he, he really has a knack for reef keeping, and he's all into the details. He's like a crazy mad scientist. And he's down in Austin, and he's moving. But in the meantime, he's not sure where he's moving to, so he's taking his reef tank, and he's moving it from Austin into Ryan's fish room. Ryan has a beautiful 1,000-gallon reef that's been featured on Tidal Garden's channel. If you haven't seen his... Uh, his tank yet you should check it out and he's got a lot of room in the back and he's going to put um, <clears throat> Aaron's tank in his background of his thousand gallon tank you know in other words in his room the room is so large he can put that size tank in there which is pretty cool so the plan is to go down to Austin and film 
the tank move in its entirety from going from there, coming here to the Dallas-Fort Worth area and being set up. And so that is going to be on a upcoming weekend this month, uh, the 20th, 21st. So that weekend we won't be doing a live stream because I'll be busy, gone. Caitlin will be filming and we're just gonna be moving this tank. So we're gonna show the whole process from beginning to end. So you can actually see a tank move with all the gory details and the salt and you know, everything that, all the messy parts. I thought that'd be kind of cool to feature and uh, Aaron thought it was a great idea too. <laughs> Maybe he just wants some really good footage before the tank is gone. <laughs> but anyway, that's coming up. So Q-Ball says, when doing a tank transfer, in what order would you recommend moving the established tank to the bigger tank? What about the aggression issues? Uh, the nice thing about doing a tank transfer, when you're moving all of your livestock out of a smaller aquarium into a bigger one, they're typically going into a, a totally different aquascape. You know, you're not going to like pluck it out, put it in the new tank, and the fish says, oh, I know this place. It's going to be completely different. Um, everything's going to smell different. Everything's going to taste different to them. You know, the sand was kicked up or the rock was uh, blasted clean or you used putty. Uh, there's the glue from the PVC pipe. There's a lot going on in the water. The fish are completely on alert. Plus, you had to catch them, so they're a little bit stressed. You moved them probably into a barrel with an air stone and a heater for X amount of hours with all the other fish. So they were kind of together but ignoring each other like they were in isolation but not really. And then finally, you put them in the tank. They usually don't have aggression issues because everything's new to everyone at the same time. So as you're doing your tank transfer, even if it took you a couple of hours to get every single fish moved in, there's no aggression like territorial squabbles because there's been no territories established quite yet. So you don't have to worry about that at all. And I've done several tank transfers, way more than I've done brand new start from the ground up setups. And with tank transfers, I just moved stuff over and everything just did well. And I think you'll find you'll have the exact same experience. Uh, Jaden says, I'm going to purchase my first saltwater fish tomorrow. Can you recommend anything to me? Um, typically, a normal first fish may be a clownfish or a damsel. Uh, the downside of buying a damsel is they tend to be aggressive, and when they're aggressive, they, um, in other words, you'll have them in the tank, and then it seems like everything you try to put in afterwards, the damsel attacks it. And so people like to use the damsel as a, a starter fish or to make sure the cycle has been established, but the problem is, is that they're so darn mean later on, you regret having them. So it'd be so much smarter to just not get a damselfish at all and get something else. The clownfish, like I said, is a great starter fish. It's very hardy, you can handle a lot, and they're beautiful and they live a very long time. Um, if you're looking for something a little bit more, um, what should I say, delicate? Maybe something in the basslet family, like the Royal Grama is really pretty. Um, there's a, uh, two color pseudochromis that looks so the royal grama is part purple part yellow and it kind of does a gradient where the two colors touch and then there's the twin color pseudochromis that's just a straight line i think i'm saying that right i haven't seen that fish in so long but literally there's like a line it's like half a purple fish and half a yellow fish is glued together and that's not the royal grama but either of those are kind of a cool little fish to have down near the sand bed they like to live in a hole and stick their head out little gobies are super cute uh, the fang blenny is really pretty. Lawnmower blenny is pretty cool. These are all fish that, you know, you could you could probably find some top 10 video of best new fish to get for a saltwater tank and check that out and uh, get your answer on some recommended ones. But, you know, I would try to go something simple, <clears throat> something healthy, hearty, colorful, and don't try to get lots of fish now. Just get that one and see how the tank does for a couple of weeks and then look at, and like I said, do the research on what else you could get in the coming weeks and months of your reef tank. <clears throat> Odile, thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Uh, Macy's daddy says, you've mentioned you're not a fish disease guy. I'm guessing because you buy healthy fish and keep them healthy. That's kind of it. I haven't really run into any major fiascos. You know, I think I've dealt with way more coral pests than I ever did fish pests. And while my fish are not 100% perfect, they're not shredded. <laughs> they're not emaciated. They're they're not nightmares. I mean, I remember buying a setup years ago, 
Uh, it was a 55 gallon aquarium and the water quality was so bad on that tank. The nitrates were measuring 200 and it was amazing anything was alive on the tank, but I was, you know, I was buying the setup, I bought everything. And it came with a coral beauty and the entire face of the coral beauty was just gone, just eroded away. It looked really, really bad. And I just maintained good water quality. And about nine months later, I noticed, you know, I mean, I was watching, but I didn't really put two and two together. But I noticed like that the face was almost completely healed from the good water. So that was really neat. So all that destruction, that erosion that had happened was, uh, had receded away and new, I guess, uh, scales had replaced it. And uh, the fish looked fantastic, which was really, really nice. But yeah, the, the better your water quality is, the more stable and consistent your water is, the more likely your fish will do well long term. Uh, Dennis says, I have a powder blue tang already in the tank. Can I put in a Nasso? I think you shouldn't have a problem because those are completely different shaped fish. So you can actually enjoy that and uh, have the two together. Um, you may want to put some kind of divider in the tank, like egg crate, to kind of like split the tank up where the one fish is from the other, or do the peacemaker thing I do, where you've got them separated initially and then after a few days open up. But powder blues are not crazy aggressive. They're fast, but they're not like known to be bullies. Uh, the purple tang is way more of a bully than a powder blue. So I think, and I used to have a powder blue with this Nasso. So, uh, and again, that was a tank transfer. We just scooped them and put them in the tank, and I never saw any kind of fighting whatsoever. Uh, Huang says, I bought a powder blue tang yesterday, and my fish in my tank ganged up on it and killed it in four hours. I know I can't have any more fish in my tank due to the aggressiveness. I'd like to know what the other fish are. If you're still, uh, you know, here in the chat group, tell us what your fish were. You may need to remove all the fish from the tank and rearrange the rock work and then introduce them back in because now you've changed all the territories and then you could probably get a new fish again. But it, I'm surprised to hear that so many fish took out a powder blue. So uh, again, maybe it was what I talked about earlier about the whole principle of keeping them separated for three days first or longer. If you can keep them in the in the peacemaker for a duration and then finally release, you may find that you won't have that aggression. I talked about the the uh, the hormone that's in the water that creates that aggressive response out of your nor your regular reeflings. And so those fish just go bonkers and they want to pounce on whatever newcomer came in and they don't even care what he looks like. So Maybe that would be the solution, but it's a shame to hear that that happened. I, I'd really like to know what the four fish were you had. That was the end of the video. Sleeping Giant says, I quarantine all my fish, but I keep my fish purchases limited. Corals and inverts I buy all day long. <laughs> that sounds like me. You know, I don't get fish very often. It's actually pretty rare. It seems like maybe once or twice a year I get a fish. I don't have the desire to buy fish. I'm all about corals and watching the corals grow and seeing how they react and, and how they change their shape and how they respond to feedings and how they, you know, like a water change, anything like that. Uh, Nitrox says, I'm looking at a pipefish for a 100 liter tank. What are your thoughts? That's a great idea. I've actually thought about getting pipefish for my 400 gallon tank, which, what is that, 1600 liters? I don't know something like that. Uh, I definitely think you could put one in your tank and it'd be really nice and it would pick off little parasites off of corals. Sleeping Giant, thank you. You don't need to, but thank you very much for the offer. That's very nice of you. He said he wants to send me a big bottle of Crown for Christmas, straight from Canada. Well, that's where it comes from. That's where the good stuff comes from. <laughs> what? What? Smoking Reefer said, if you bought a hundred flame angels, how many do you think would be naughty? A <laughs> hundred? Uh, that would be really cool. Flame angels are kind of 50-50 uh, in the regard that there's a 50% chance they'll be fine. There's a 50% chance they're naughty, which means they nip on corals. Um, so would I say that 50 out of a hundred are going to be bad? I don't know. But I do know a guy, uh, matter of fact, one of the first reef keepers I met in my area, uh, back in 2002, he had a tank set up that had quite a bit of rock work, and he had zoanthids and things in there. And I didn't know that he had so many flame angels, but he dropped in some food to show me, 
and all five came swimming out and it was beautiful and they swam around and, and it was a harem of flame angels and boy did i want to do that but i never had the courage to try uh you know but i've had i had a flame angel in this tank not too long ago and then one day it just was gone i mean it wasn't causing any problems which i was very happy about it just one day it was gone i don't know if the sea bay ate it i don't know if it got into the rock work and a starfish ate it i don't know but i don't have it anymore and i didn't try to get another one but smoking reefers, if you ever buy a hundred, I want you to tell me how many were naughty. <laughs> I'm gonna put it back in your lap. Screams Reef says, I made it to the live this week. How have you been? Doing pretty good, though I'm tired all the time. I, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I just I have projects every single day. I don't remember the last time I had a real day off. Um, I need a day off, but even like today, I have things to do. Tomorrow, I have things to do. We've had beautiful weather uh, recently here in Texas, and I guess everywhere, I don't know. Uh, it's November and it's in the 70s here, and so I've been working in the yard, and I, I just I want to get things done before it gets cold, and I don't want to go outside. So that's good, but bad because I really just want to lie around and do nothing and just vegetate and recharge my batteries. Valhalla says, "I feel bad that you had to point out such obvious concepts. Guess that means there's many imbeciles in the reefing hobby. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means." that not everyone knows what you consider to be common. And we all learn at different rates. We all were new at one point. And if we don't bring up these things to teach the newer newcomers how it works, they're gonna make mistakes and lives are gonna be lost because of it. So instead, by going over some of these, what you consider basic knowledge, it benefits them. It also reminds us old timers <laughs> what we should be doing and that we shouldn't be lazy. I mean, I, if anything, you could take away from this live stream today is that Mark, me, should have a quarantine tank and i just have not done it and i don't know that i want to set one up i've had really good success with safety stop but uh you know it's just been how i do my channel i try to educate everyone i you know what i sometimes matter of fact i'm going to do a question on the community tab here on my youtube channel after the show and i'm going to ask you to reply and you can only post once on those as far as i know you can only reply once Tell me what topic you'd like me to discuss in future live streams. Just give me your list and maybe I'll, I'll pick it. Um, so everyone can chime in with a topic. And I'll tell you, sometimes people say, hey, I really would like you to get into this difficult topic. And my brain says, yeah, that's a cool topic, but I feel like only 2% of people are going to really get into it and 98% won't care. So my goal with this channel is to reach as many people as possible, to give as much knowledge to as many people, I'm not dumbing it down, but I'd rather help 98 people then help two people be super successful. So, you know, if I, I'd like to cover things that if someone's been in the hobby a long time can also benefit from, but I really want to reach those that just don't have the experience that they haven't lived through the school of hard knocks. And I'd like to help them avoid things going wrong. So that is why I handle this channel the way I do. Um, there are times where we have really deep topics and there's lots of topics that are lightweight and they go a long way to help people. So I don't think anyone's an imbecile. I think they all need to learn and uh, we're talking about animals. Just like if, if this channel is all about puppies, you just can't just go at it half-baked. Half you have to go in and know what you're doing so that puppy will thrive and grow into a beautiful dog. So that's how I handle it this way. That's why. <laughs> Cue Balls Reef says, my Ocellaris is trying to take up residence in my Duncan coral. The Duncan is a reluctant host. How can I get the clown to stop squatting? Maybe you can put some other coral in there that looks more appealing to that clownfish. Maybe you could move the dunk into a new location where the clownfish thinks, okay, I don't... Because there is something, uh, there was a person, I think her name was Joyce Wilkerson. She did a, clown, a book about clownfish. And then there was Daphne Fountain also. And one of those two people came to speak to our club at our Next Wave event. And she talked about how she went into the wild and found an anemone filled with clownfish and she took the clownfish out and let it go six inches away and this clownfish went right back in then she took the clownfish out and she went 12 inches away and then she let it go and then she took the clownfish out of the anemone and went back 18 inches and then 24 inches and then 26 inches and at one point the clownfish did not know where to go it like it's almost like the clownfish is short-sighted <laughs> and did not see where home was anymore and so she determined how far they go from their their spot so you may be able to move the Duncan out of that clownfish's spot and it doesn't want to travel more than six or eight inches 
and it might choose to live in a bubble tip anemone or a frog spawn or, or some green star polyps or whatever that's in your tank. That's a chance. Or the Duncan can tolerate it, the coral will continue to grow, and eventually the clownfish just decides to move out on its own. I have two Duncan colonies over here in the corner of the tank, and the uh, one or two skunk clownfish tend to be in it all the time, and hasn't affected the coral at all that I can tell. But they're not beating it to death. They're just kind of using it as a really cool place to relax, like a nice soft mattress. Huh, that's interesting. Marcus says, I found dark buckets versus light buckets. Light going through the bucket seems to have a better survivability when acclimating. Huh. You know, I like the white bucket because that way anything that comes off the fish or, you know, the fish poops, you can see it in the bottom of the bucket very clearly. But I guess it might show up in a black bucket as well if you take a flashlight to it when you're done. That's interesting. I, I really prefer nice white buckets for myself, so I know they're clean and I know they're good to go. But thanks for the tip. That's interesting. And I have like one or two buckets. I could I could try that sometime and see what if there's any difference. Oh, okay. Uh, Jason says, "What fish are being added to the reef?" Three uh, purple Fridmon. Um, Hell freaky. Hell freaky. Uh, darkfish are going into the big reef because I wanted something tiny and cute, and I wanted to get three because I thought they'd be a nice trio. I hope they'd like to hang out together. That's my hope. So we'll see what happens. And then in the anemone cube, Caitlin is getting a couple of uh, gobies. What are they called? Randall gobies and a matching uh, shrimp. So that'd be really cute. And got five Bengai cardinal fish to go in that tank because the Bengais can go into the anemone tentacles. So it should add some interesting diversity into the tank and kind of I don't know, show more stuff and less tentacles maybe? We'll see. I'm looking for the next question. Oh, this is a great question, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> Ak says, I'd like to add a blue throw trigger to my 190-gallon peaceful reef. Any recommendations? I also want to add a Maxima clam. Are they compatible? I don't know if that trigger eats clams or not. I'm sorry, I just don't know. Uh, I haven't had a clam in so long in my reef tank. I just, you know, I, the last one I had was a Maxima, and it was in the anemone cube. And the eel ate the clam, which surprised me. I didn't expect that. And I just didn't get one since. And I've stopped remembering. But you know what? I have a book on clams I got from James Fothery that I can do some reading. And maybe I can get you that answer later. And uh, I believe there's a new book in the works right now also from James, like a follow-up. And so that would be another good read. I do highly recommend you guys read stuff, whether it's Coral Magazine or get some reef books. Because there's so much good knowledge and great pictures to enjoy. And it's just nice to hold a nice hardcover book <laughs> and just flip through it and, and get some knowledge. Uh, there's a very strong article in here that I did not like as I start working on uh, the latest issue of Coral. And this one here was talking about the Project Phoenix may reveal countless new species. And what it is is they're looking at renaming the corals completely differently from what they've been called before in the past. And I don't know how I feel about changing the names of the corals. I, you know, I'm used to certain things, and they're saying, well, based on what we're going to learn on their genomes, uh, it's going to completely put the entire scientific community on its head. Not the hobbyists. The scientific community. The scientists that write the books. All their stuff's going to be outdated, and it has to be completely updated for this new naming system. Not excited about that at all. And I don't know if I'm going to accept it. <laughs> so... We'll see what happens there. Uh, Gal Gal says, what do you treat your fish in quarantine? What products? Well, I use safety stuff, which uh, is a two-part bath. And this stuff here is formalin and methylene blue. And there's a whole video about safety stuff on this channel you can watch. And it'll answer all your questions. That's the only thing I use. When it comes to quarantine, if I actually do put fish in quarantine, 
they stay in the box and I feed and I do the water changes and I make sure the water stays good. I don't use any chemicals in there whatsoever. I don't run UV in there. Uh, there's nothing. It's just filtered water and make sure the fish is fat and healthy. Um, if I ended up seeing like the fish is covered in fluke or flukes or if it suddenly broke out an ick, then I have to figure out what to do next. But I haven't had to encounter that. I've been lucky. I don't know. I've only been in the hobby for 23 years, but so far so good. <laughs> Uh, Trent says, do you think a mirror next to the tank can help with the aggression when adding a new fish uh, when you don't have a peacemaker? You can try that. Uh, sometimes that fish that's aggressive will fight the glass, but if the tank is acrylic, they will scratch up the acrylic big time trying to fight the other fish. So some people do use a mirror. It's not ideal. Uh, sometimes they will put an iPad or a video to show another similar fish. It's really a distraction technique, and it may or may not work. So... Uh, I, that's what I was saying. If you can put some egg crate in the tank to create like a 50-50 or a 60-40 environment, you can have the new fish in one part and the other fish in the other part, and that way they see each other, but they can't touch each other for a long time. And I think that's pretty smart in keeping them completely isolated from each other, but sharing the same water. Uh, Aaron says, what level do you try and keep your phosphate at? 0 0.1 ppm is fine with me. Uh, it can be a little bit higher. It tends to be a little bit higher because I tend to feed really well. I have the auto feeders going during the daytime, and then at night I also put in frozen food. All right. Um, our fish girl says that if you use the mirror that you would be unnecessarily stressing the fish. So maybe the lights out approach would be a better uh, thing to do because it's just dark and the fish tend to retreat. They aren't nearly as aggressive and they can't see well to get into a battle. Uh, Andrew says, do you recommend adding all fish at once? I don't have a local no. fish store, and I get my fish from Live Aquaria. I save tons on shipping when I buy all my fish at once. Well, you can, but can the new tank handle that massive bio load all at once? That's the problem. That's why we like to add fish gradually. So if you want to save money and you want to get a lot of fish at once, I'd almost like to see you have multiple tanks running so you could have your main tank and you introduce some fish into it and you have the others in quarantine or in hospital tanks or in, you know you can just kind of keep them all alive to save this money but I don't know you might find the amount of money you're spending on the, running extra tanks just because you want to get a lot at once I, you know it depends on the size of the tank if you have like a thousand gallon tank and you want to get a lot of fish at once I get it uh, Jimmy just put a tank in his house that is something like six thousand gallons um, he's the guy who did the SPS reef in Las Vegas and he got yeah and he got so many fish at once and he dropped them in. But the tank is ginormous, like 22 feet long. And the fish were like little postage stamps swimming around. And they were doing 500-gallon water changes daily. So the fish had, didn't affect them whatsoever. But if you've got this really cool you know, water box that's like, I don't know, 70 gallons of water, and you decide to buy 23 fish, that's not going to go well. It's not going to go well at all. So I would not recommend getting them all at that point. I'd rather see you get just the ones you want right now and pay this, you know, you might get free shipping depending on what you buy. and Or you might have to pay shipping. <laughs> this is, no one ever said this is a cheap hobby. Let's look for the next question. Um, Tahoe Underground says, no, he has two questions. When should I worry about not seeing my leopard wrasse? Uh, wrasses can dive into the sand bed and they can be there for a day or weeks. That does happen. And then they suddenly come out again. Uh, I tried that exact wrasse a while back and I put it in. I saw it for two or three days and I never saw it again. So there is a chance that you may have similar luck as I did, or maybe I just was really bad luck. You know, I would like that. I'd like to have that wrasse. It's really pretty. But uh, I remember getting a fish from a hobbyist here in the local area, but their schedule is completely opposite mine. And I put the fish in my tank, and it went straight into the sand bed, and I never saw it. And, you know, the days the light would come on, and uh, just never saw this yellow coarse wrasse. And then one... I don't know what it was. It was like early in the morning or late at night. I saw it swing around the tank and the lights were out. And I thought, that is so weird. And what it was was the, the wrasse had not learned my schedule yet. And it was on its own schedule, its own clock that it was used to. 
And so it was swimming around when the lights would have been on in its former tank. And so now that it was in my tank, it had to learn my schedule. And after a while, it learned my own schedule. And then it was going into the sand bed the moment the light shut off. It was crazy how accurate. They, they learn. They have this amazing internal clock. And they know they'll circle the sand bed as the seconds are counting down. I'm like, how do they know what time it is? And then you just watch it go in, lights off. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it was that. It was so precise. It's insane. But uh, yeah, if you have one that just doesn't come out whatsoever for a really long time, it may never come out again. Um, but uh, it could just be learning your schedule, um, or it could be spooked from something else in the tank, and it's going to take a few days to get used to it. And then the other part of your question was, how do you take pictures of a tank and eliminate the blue? So I have this little thing that I've been recommending for a super long time, and it just clips right onto my phone. It's from Pull-Up Labs. A lot of brands come out with different versions of this. IceCap has it. Uh, Dell Tech has it. This one is from Pull-Up Labs. And it just clips onto your phone, and there's a couple different filters. So this is an orange filter. This is actually the original prototype. This is a yellow filter, and I stack them, and I can remove both, and I can put a magnifier on there instead. And then they have a polarizing filter where you put it on, and then you twist it, and as you twist back and forth, you can actually dial in and out the blue to get that perfect look. But I find that using both of these almost always works really well for me. So now if I were in my camera mode, and I was wanting to take a picture of my tank, I don't know if I can do this, but if you look, you can see it's not nearly as blue. It filters out all the blue, and I can get a nice picture of the coral in question. And if it doesn't look right, I can remove one of the filters and then try again. And of course, you can just remove it, and then you can see it's hideous blue, and you can't see anything. And that's why we have these clips. And I highly recommend them. I actually have one left in my inventory, um, and then that's it. But uh, it's what I recommend. It, it fits on most phones. It can clip on the side and clip on the top. I love it. So I recommend it. Flipper also has one that you, I think it magnetizes the back of your phone and then folds over with the orange lens. And when you're done, you fold it back out of your way again. Another thing you can do is change your lights. <laughs> turn off the blue and turn on daylight and just take pictures of your tank while it looks nice. Hey, look, it hasn't moved at all. It's still exactly where we left it. It's great. Uh, John Smith asked, have you ever owned a golden basslet? I have not, so I don't have any advice on that one. Uh, Michael Moore says, I have a question. On a weekly water change, after using my Fritz Complete, do I have to add the Biochem as well? You have to ask Fritz. I don't know. I'm getting little notes over here. All right. Uh, that one I already answered. Uh, Charlie says, any thoughts on the Euphilia only a tank? Only tank. I plan to collect different ones and rare species of torches, hammers, etc. You can definitely do it. Uh, there was a tank, I think it's up in Colorado, where the entire tank, you know, it's like four feet by four feet, and it's just this ginormous hammer coral. Jake Adams did a video about this one tank. It was really cool. But it was one hammer. It wasn't a bunch like you're trying to do. I can tell you what you're wanting to do is really cool, and you may be able to pull it off, and it may look fantastic. My friend Lori, who died earlier this year, um, she had all these different torches, and when her tank was glowing blue, they looked their best. And she had quite the variety. It was actually fantastic. But I know some other people, they'll spend a lot of money on these really gorgeous corals, and they are usually the first ones to go, which is really frustrating. And the ones that are hardy are the ones you don't care about. So if you want to do it, of course, it's just like any reef. You want to maintain good water quality. You want to make sure nothing's nipping at them. Uh, you got to stay on top of your system. But yeah, I'd, and I'd love to see you post some pictures of it in Club Milo's Reef. So if you are not a member, you need to join. And if you are a member, you need to be posting up some information. So it's just facebook.com slash groups slash Me Loves Reef. And yeah, I'd love to see the progress of this tank as you're doing it. I'd like to see all your tanks. So, I mean, that's an open invitation to all of you. Please come join us. There's about 80, 200, 80, 300 people in there now. And the only rule we have in that group is you got to be nice. So we, we literally don't allow people to put others down. We just remove them forever. And that's that. So it's designed to be a place where you can ask questions and not be put down or be insulted. And uh, we've been running for over two years now and welcome you to join us.
It, it was literally made for you YouTubers to come on Facebook <laughs> in this one nice safe group. Uh, Aaron says, where do you post your test results as I can't seem to find them? I was posting them on Instagram and I haven't done it in a long time. I just did my test results. They're on my kitchen counter. If you come on over, you can read them right there on the piece of paper. <laughs> I just updated my phone to the brand new phone and uh, it copied everything over except the Reef Trace app, which I thought was really funny. I think the reason is because I have the, uh, the test flight version, which is the one that's always being beta tested. So I, I always get the latest. So if there's any kind of problem, I'll stumble on it. I can let them know this didn't work. And so I think only because I'm in test flight that it didn't copy it over like it would if I was a purchased app owner because all the rest of my apps are on the phone. I have to let Jose know about that. But uh, Or maybe he's listening right now and he's like, oh yeah, of course, that's totally normal. But it was weird because on my home page, which is my favorite icons, the only icon that was missing was Reef Trace. And I thought, how weird is that? But yeah, putting all my parameters in there and then I'll take a screenshot and I'll share that into Instagram and went to Facebook. Sometimes I bumped them into Club Miller's Reef, but I haven't done it in a long time. Uh, Pickle Boy says, my aunt is going to set up a 29 gallon reef tank soon. Can she use natural spring water or to start up her tank or should she use RODI water? She should use RODI water. Uh, Scott says, hello from Scotland and nice beard. What's the best algae eating fish for a three foot 60 gallon tank? Uh, well, you see, there's not algae really wins. a fish that just eats algae consistently and gets rid of it all. You can definitely have a lawnmower blenny, which will nip at the algae. You could have some other fish that likes to chew, like Snail. mollies, for example. But your cleanup crew is your snails and your hermit crabs. They're going to work on it. And you want to stay on top of your water quality so it never gets out of hand. The, uh, I think one of the big problems people have is they set up a new tank and the first thing they do is turn on the skimmer, even though they shouldn't, and they turn on the lights, which they shouldn't, and they cycle the tank. So during the cycle, there should be no filtration and there should be no light. And then and there's actually a video on this channel. It's called Let's Discuss the Reef Timeline. And if you haven't watched that one yet, you should definitely tune into that one because I go through month by month what you should do next so it goes in the right order so you have the best success overall. But you should not have algae growing out of control in your tank. I just told you guys earlier in this uh, conversation how I let my, well, I didn't let, but my auto feeder went crazy and my phosphates were 0.75, which is way higher than 90% of you. And I was not even slightly worried, oh my goodness, I'm going to have algae all over my tank. It doesn't even enter my brain because I have a cleanup crew and I have fish and I just don't have a problem whatsoever. If you get in here and look closely, you might see some bubble algae here and there. But that's just because Spock can't get to it because she's too darn big. <laughs> but other than that, the tank's essentially clean, and I never have algae problems in it. Now, my frag tank has been a hidden secret for a while. It's just been a neglected tank. It's had all kinds of issues. I keep wanting to tear it down, and I haven't. And uh, I'd say about 10 days ago or so, maybe two weeks ago, I put in reflux, which is fluconazole, to remove the bubble algae that has just taken over that tank. It was ridiculous. And I'd say 50% of it's gone. So that was a nice thing to watch that product work exactly as predicted. And uh, I still need to go and clean the skimmer and turn it back on. And it's just the tank is just kind of idling. But I told you guys a couple weeks ago how during a power outage, when the power was restored, the anemone cube was making this really strange sound. And it was like a slurp, slurp, slurp. And it never makes that sound. And so I got up on the stepladder and I looked down in the overflow box and I could see a rose anemone being sucked into the drain pipe and it was shredding the anemone. It was just, it was being sucked hard and, and torn. And so I rescued the anemone and I dropped it into the frag tank and it hid for about two or three days. And now it's out and it's beautiful and the clownfish that are in that tank are in it and they're loving it. So I know the water quality in that tank is doing well. It's just not perfect. And it's, you know, like I said, that tank's been neglected for a long time and that's my fault. I'm focused on this one and the anemone cube. And so I don't put a lot of effort into that one, which I don't know what I'm going to do with that tank, but eventually it'll turn into something. But for now, it needs to be completely broken down. I need to polish all the acrylic so it's shiny again because the inside's all ruined. And uh, I need to clean up, you know, clean up the rock work and do something different. Uh, Steve says, I have tiny white chalky dots that I keep scraping off the back of the tank. How can I stop them from forming? Well, those are called... Um, 
spororbid worms, and they're a sign of a healthy tank, and they're easy to scrape off, and they do no harm, and they're filter feeders. And it sounds to me like your tank is doing really well if you're seeing them. I understand they're a slight nuisance, but they come off really easily with either a razor blade or a credit card. And uh, I like you, I like to keep the back glass of the tank pristine. And so you just chip them away, but there's no like thing that's just gonna devour them and erase them, they just exist. Uh, it's a very normal part of a healthy reef ecosystem and I wouldn't sweat it. You'll also find them down on your pumps in your sump. You'll find them inside plumbing pipes. Uh, you'll see them in the baffles. They'll, they'll even show up on power heads and stuff. I mean, it's normal. If you keep up with your cleaning and don't let things go too long, they aren't too hard to remove. If you let them really get embedded in your system, you have to soak your stuff in citric acid or white vinegar for a while and then scrape them all clean and get it nice and cleaned up. Maker of Things says, I have about 50 pounds of rock from a tank breakdown, and it was full of every pest, <laughs> so I put it in buckets outside. How do I clean, revive it, and set it up for a tank for a friend for Christmas? I don't know if you can set it up fast enough. I mean, yes, you can, but, I mean, you're talking about seven weeks, maybe six weeks. I would immediately, today, get into a bucket or a trash can filled with salt water, and I would start scrubbing them in the salt water and change the water immediately. And then just keep it with circulating salt water for the next few weeks and test the water. Maybe change the water weekly on that barrel. What are you going to change? 15, 20, 25 gallons of water in the trash can? And you'll get the rock nice and clean, and uh, it'll be ready to go in a tank, and it won't be... Uh, well, you have to test the water to see if it's exuding anything vile. Uh, since it was sitting out in buckets, I'm assuming it's in buckets without water. If it was in buckets with water, it'd probably be even worse. <laughs> So I'm assuming these are just basically they dry it out in buckets. And the thing is, the inside of the rock, the core is still wet. If you were to break it open like an egg, the inside would have bacteria that is alive and th not thriving, but it's existing. And when you submerge that rock in salt water, that kind of stuff just comes out of the pores and it causes chaos. So you're going to want to test for ammonia and nitrite and see how it does. But maybe, I mean, I don't know. It would be a lot of work, but for you to work on cleaning and changing water weekly to actually set up a tank by Christmas with that rock might be a challenge. But you could definitely put it through its paces through salt water and scrubbing and uh, get it basically, you're, essentially what you're doing is you're cycling it in salt water and you're changing the water regularly and you're shaking it off in the salt water and you're removing anything that bothers you and you keep putting in fresh clean salt water every week after week after week and then maybe, yeah, you could possibly start starting, you could start the new tank around Christmas time with it, but I don't know if you'd be ready for livestock. Aaron says, are chalice corals aggressive? Some, the Hollywood Stunner is a well-known aggressive coral that has to be completely by itself because it puts out these sweepers that are very long, six, eight inches long, maybe more, and they will kill anything in their area to continue to grow bigger. So they sting everything to create space and then they grow larger and they sting more and it never stops. So that one is, this one here, I never see any kind of sweepers come out of it, and it's a huge coral that's probably, I don't know, 20 inches across now. I've been growing it for many years. Uh, Saltwater Reef says, every time my affiliate gets close to splitting heads instead of splitting, the uh, polyp bails. I'm not sure what the splitter's supposed to do. Well, yeah, they're supposed to create a bubble in between. The head will just have a bubble. And then after a while, the bubble just vanishes, and then there's literally two heads, and they, they will separate apart, and you'll have two. Um, the fact that you just have polyps bailing sounds like there's a water quality problem, or there's too much flow on that coral, and it's just tearing the tissue, and it's ripping it out. Or you have a fish that's nipping and pulling them out. Or you have some kind of a critter that's pulling them out, which could be, too, like a really big worm that hides in your rock work. A uh, butterfly fish could be something that nips at it. Uh, an angel fish, like a... Flame Angel or Coral Beauty could be nipping at it. Um, copper Band could be attacking it. I mean, these are things that could be happening. Um, but if you can really keep your water stable, that will help. Then what I would do is I will turn off all the lights in the room, 
and I would sit far away from the tank or stand in the corner and watch the tank from a distance and see, observe the fish for 10 or 15 minutes and just watch their habits because they have a routine and you can see if any fish are going toward that coral on a regular basis and irritating it and see if you can figure out who's causing the chaos. Uh, Thomas says, are there any power heads you can mount at a 45 to 90 degree angle? Tunzi came out with one many years ago, but most of them are less than that angle. Um, I run Vortex, and you just put them flat on the glass, and they just blow water this way, and they suck water back into themselves, and it creates a giant amount of water moving, but I don't have to like tilt them or aim them, and I never have, and I love that I don't have to think about it. But I have done things in the past. Even a maxi jet could be put at certain angles, and you could twist the nozzle and get like a 45 or a 90 degree angle. But uh, what is the need for that specific demand? Some people put pumps right on the back of the tank, blowing forward, and they put a couple on the ends, and it moves this way. Um, there's the gyres that you can put anywhere, and you could twist the uh, the screen to kind of shoot at a different angle. But 45 to 90 is a very specific number. Uh, something that you might like instead of all of that is the sea swirl. The sea swirl is a motor that sits on the top of your tank. It kind of is <laughs> about the size of, uh, I don't know, size of a small book. And the plumbing goes into the sea swirl and comes through it and goes into the tank with a nozzle. And the motor spins the nozzle back and forth very slowly to constantly change the way the flow is in the tank. And the sea swirl has been around for a very long time. And uh, they were very popular back in the day, and they still exist. And with those, you could pick 45, 90, 180 degrees, and you can actually have it pivot back and forth. And the motor's out of the water. All you have down in the water is the PVC pipe. Um, Alex, thank you for the super chat. He says, I keep getting brown diatom-like fuzz algae. Nitrate is 0 0.05 phosphate, question mark. <laughs> Um, the system is about 150 gallons, tank is five years old, it's packed with coral and fish. You know, sometimes you're going to get some weird thing on your sand bed that just never seems to go away. And it's, all, it, like you said, it's like diatoms or it's this weird brown rust looking stuff. It's like a mulm. Uh, it can get, like you said, a little fuzzy. And it just seems to never go away and you stir the sand and it comes right back. And you're just thinking, well, is it this? Is it that? Is it the other? And I had it in my tank for a while, and I think at the time when I had it, my tank was dealing with, I was running bio pellets. So maybe what it, your solution might be for now is to remove all those extraneous things that are in your sump and just get down to the protein skimmer, good flow, um, and really good water quality with, you know, dosing. And, you know, just eliminate all those extra things. I mean, there's so many things we plug into our tanks. There's a nitrate reducer, there's a UV sterilizer, there's an algae turf scrubber, there's a bio pellet reactor, um, there's a vodka doser, there's this, there's that. We're putting in amino acids and we're doing just adding all these products. And maybe stop dosing all those things and then let the tank just kind of run in simplified mode. And that brown stuff may burn itself out and then it'll just be gone. And then you can gradually introduce those pieces of equipment again and get things going the way you liked it before, and hopefully that stuff won't return. So that would be my suggestion, especially in a tank that's five years old, it's established. I don't want you to make any great changes. I'm actually just saying simplify it, remove some of the stuff, the toys that you like, clean them up, set them aside, get them ready for when you're ready to hook them up again. But for now, I would just kind of get down to the basics, and you may find that you have solved the problem. Because like I said, my tank had some of that for a while, and then just finally went away, and I didn't do anything. And my system is pretty simple. I mean, there's not a lot of crazy stuff going on in my tank. I've seen people with way more intense setups running the reefs, and uh, it's amazing. It looks like the cockpit from an airplane, and mine's kind of like this, this, and this, and I keep my hands out of it. <laughs> so I'm kind of suggesting you do something similar, and please let me know if that helped you or not. Uh, James says, I've heard that it's better with overnight shipments with fish. It's just better to put them in the tank versus a drip acclimate because when you open the bag, the fish could die from pneumonia. Well, you're hearing different things, and you're, you're not quite right on that. So there's truth in part of what you described. The fish that were shipped pee in the bag, and the pee is putting ammonia in the water. But there's no fresh air in the bag, and so the ammonia is depressed, the pH is depressed. And by adding oxygen to the water, the ammonia kind of like kicks in and it can burn their gills. 
So what we do, you know, I'm not a big drip acclimate kind of guy. I'm more adding liquid, you know, because the drip acclimate, you're talking about dripping, drip, 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 drip. But if you wanted to drip acclimate, you can. But all I do is say, take your fish with its water and pour it in some small container, a bucket, a styrofoam cooler. You know, you just need a few inches of water. Uh, it, you maybe have a little tiny cooler that's ideal for this one fish. And you pour the fish and the water into that cooler. You can even add some prime to lock up the ammonia immediately. And you add an air stone and you add a small heater. They have those little tiny heaters at Petco that are like $5, $8, $11 that don't even have a thermostat. You plug them in and they just maintain 75 degrees. So you know that the water won't get any colder than that. And so you're keeping the temperature of the water right. You've locked up the ammonia and you've added oxygen, which is now raising the pH in the water. And then you have your water dripping in or, in, you know, I'd prefer you trickle it in. Uh, or like I said, take a small cup and pour in a certain amount and you add a cup every seven minutes. And it was within 45 minutes to 50 minutes, you'll double the water volume, maybe even tripled it. And that ammonia won't affect the fish at all. But to take a brand new fish that's shipped overnight and just dump it in the tank, I would never do that because the salinity may not even be correct. Um, last time you did order something online, did you verify what the salinity was of the fish you just bought versus the salinity in your tank to see if they even match? Because odds are they're not the same. Uh, Aaron says, why won't you put Dory in your main reef? Dory will eat zoanthids. So I don't want her in there because I like zoanthids. So she's in the frag tank, which is great because the frag tank could use a little bit of maintenance. It's a 60 gallon system. It's a four foot tank. So she went out of a two foot tank and went into a four foot tank. She's, her world has just been doubled. Oh, great. Dennis says, yesterday I bought the Auto Aqua Smart Stir. The unit is a lifesaver. Easy to use in my salad for test kits. Please show it on the live stream. Everyone should have one. <laughs> I agree. That's why I bought, you know, 10 of them to put in the shop. Um, Jonathan said, what kind of eel do you have and do you have to vary their diet? What did you feed? Well, I used to have two gold moray eels in the anemone cube. And when one jumped out and committed suicide, the other one went on a hunger strike and died. But I had them for about, I'd say a year and a half, I think, maybe a little bit less. And I was feeding them krill, and they really liked it. Uh, Thomas says, can you recommend a sand sifting fish appropriate for a community nano tank, including clowns, firefish, and dragonettes? Um, I'd rather see you put hermit crabs in there because they will work through the sand bed. You can put in, you didn't see what size the nano was, but if your tank is at least two feet by two feet, then you could have one sand conch in there. You can have Neisseria snails in there. They work their way through the little snails. They look like little submarines. They go down in the sand and then when the food hits the water, they all emerge and they get very active. But um, I've, the thing is, you didn't say what else was in the tank. You mentioned the fish, but you didn't say what corals you had. If you add any kind of a goby into that tank, it will sift the sand through its gills, but it could bury corals that are on there. Like if you had fungias or if you had zoanthids or if you had a small clam or anything else in that tank, it could be buried by sand. And by the time you notice it's dead because you have this fish that's filtering the sand. So I, I really don't like things that sift sand personally. Thomas Poindexter saying, there have been a few corals renamed. Hey, Thomas. They found there's only one true euphilia, the torch coral. The rest have to be reclassified. See, I hate change. <laughs> like I said, I don't think I'm going to like it, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Chef Kuma Yoke says, I have no fish, but my nitrate is 536 milligrams. I don't know what test kit you're using, but uh, let's find out what your nitrates are in PPM. And... Uh, I doubt that your nitrate is at 536. So maybe it's at 53? I don't know. But uh, we need to find out what your nitrate is, and then you probably need to do a big water change to bring that number down. 
And every 50% water change you do, so if your water volume is 50 gallons and you change 25 gallons of water, you will cut the nitrate in half with every single 50% water change. So you can change water, change water, change water several times in a week, and boom, you've brought the nitrates way down and it's safe to add your fish. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, is candy cane coral a slow grower? I've had mine a couple of months with no growth. How do new branches start? The branches won't start. What'll happen is the head will split. And then as it splits, that becomes a Y and creates a new pair of branches where one was before. You can actually feed a candy cane coral, usually after lights out. I would get some kind of a food, maybe like Vena Reef. Um, uh, you could, I really liked the Cyclops that we used to buy, but there's something on the market now, Calanus, that you can buy in a frozen cube. You can thaw it, stop the pumps in the tank, and you can thaw that cube into break it in little bits, or you can mix it with the Benary for like a paste, and you can squirt it right at that coral, and the coral will gradually open its mouth and just inhale the food, and then close up again. It's a slow process, and you have to set a timer to remind yourself to resume flow in the tank so you don't kill your fish. But uh, if you can feed the candy canes, they will grow more than just sitting in a tank, hoping to catch food randomly as you're feeding your fish from time to time. You've only had them a couple of months, I would say if you had them for a year and you saw no change, that's a real problem. I think that, you know, it takes a couple months for corals to even settle in before they get comfortable. So you should just go ahead and just enjoy what you've got. And uh, if you want to target feed them, you can by stopping the flow in the tank briefly. You could try doing Benner Reef um, in the entire system as broadcast feeding twice a week. And that coral will just inhale what it can. It won't be as much as getting a nice thick meal. Another thing you can do is you can physically put a P.E. mysis, the actual mysis shrimp, on each candy cane head and let them uh, close up and pull it in. But if you have any kind of shrimp, they may steal it. And you may have to do it again and again until you finally get one that's actually inside the mouth of the candy cane. Jerry's Little Reef says, what type of starfish should I add to my reef? Um, I don't know what size your tank is, but I like serpent starfish. They're really nice. Uh, the little fromias are pretty. Um, I'm not a fan of the brittle starfish, especially the green one. The big green, it becomes big and it eats fish, so I don't recommend that to people. And I definitely don't recommend the sand sifting starfish. Aaron says, can corals sting clams? Not usually, because the clam has a shell, but it could maybe irritate the mantle, which is the meaty part. So you may find that certain things live near it for a long time and there's no problem, and then one day there's an issue. It's always nice if you can place the clam in the tank away from other corals where there's just space. And remember, if you buy a clam, look down at it from above from time to time because they're beautiful and they're actually a different color than when you see them from the side. So no matter what clam you buy, take time and look over the rim and enjoy what you got because <laughs> it's a really cool animal to have. Uh, Shell Slinger says, just made it, um, and then he said, did you do this live stream just to remind me to buy some safety stop from you? <laughs> yes, that's why I did this live stream. <laughs> I bought a fall fish to keep some of Tasia at bay, um, but he had ick, and I lost Dory. So yeah, yeah, I'll make sure you tag me in Club Meals Reef. I'll check out your, your thread. Maybe I can do some, give you some advice. Uh, Michael Perez says, do you have any advice on diatoms in the sand bed and roller tank? I would say beef up your cleaner crew, and I think you'll find that most of that will just go away. The more stuff you have walking and crawling across the sand bed, the better. And I think that a lot of people just don't have enough stuff in their tank, and they don't replenish it. They remember buying a whole bunch at one point, but then when you ask them when was it, they're like, well, yeah, it was a while ago. And how much do you have now that you had back then? Probably half or a third, and needs to be beefed up with more. So get yourself more hermits, get yourself more snails. Uh, maybe get some kind of an urchin, uh, get some kind of a serpent starfish, get a fighting conch or a sand conch. Um, some little shrimps run across the sand bed as well. There's a lot of different things you can get that I think we don't have nearly enough in our tanks. Um, Tom, Timothy says, do you have anything against reef crystals for a small five-gallon reef? mainly softies and a couple SPS with only one goby. Are some salts better than for small tanks with water changes? 
I don't think that's going to matter. Whatever brand of salt mix you like, you should be able to use that and be comfortable. And, you know, like you said, it's a very small tank. You're going to do little tiny water changes. I imagine they're like a gallon maybe. And uh, as long as the water you're putting in the tank matches what the tank has, you'll be successful. So you want to match temperature, salinity, and alkalinity. And if all three match, you can just change water once a week or several gallons once a month, and uh, I think you'll be okay. I, I, have a, I imagine that you are changing the water weekly because the tank is so small because there's not very many filters that are going to fit on such a small tank. And then Reefer Madness says, I was wrong on the wrong account. Okay. I lost Dory after having for 18 months since birth. Wow. Um, it's a hard lesson learned the hard, the hard way. Got any safety stuff? Yes, I do. I have plenty in stock and I always get more. So if you need it, I can mail it to you. And that's one of those things that I ship and uh, it gets mailed uh, first class because it's so light. And then I refund the difference on the shipping because I know that my website charges FedEx rates and I'm not trying to take advantage of anyone. It's just what the way the website is set up. So if anything, we ship priority mail or first class, I always do that and send back money to my customers so that they can save some money for something else in the future. Uh, Smoke and Reefer says, I have quite a large refugium chamber and I don't know when to harvest the catamorpha. Do I let it pack right out, or so do I take out any at any one time? What you do <laughs> is you take out about 25%, maybe 50% once a month. There were some people back in the day that would post pictures where they had a rectangular aquarium and they lifted it out and it was like a rectangular block of keto. It was crazy. And I was like, man, you can grow that stuff because I don't have much success with that one. I do much better with feather chlorpha. But uh, you can just take out 50%. And then what's left, what you're keeping, you kind of pull it apart a little bit. You just tug it like you're stretching steel wool and you set it back in. And that way it, it'll encourage more growth and flow can go through the plant because it's not just this little brick sitting in a corner. And that's pretty much what's been recommended for a long time. Thomas says, the new classification that used to be called euphilia is now called fimbriophilia. Fim fimbriophilia. Sounds like a disease. I'm not impressed, Thomas. I don't like change. I said that already. Uh, Tim says, I really want to see some of your pictures and video from your dive trips. Do you have something to share? Not yet, but I do. Um, I'm hoping I can share something nice with you. My concern is I'm not a great underwater photographer. You know, when you're in the ocean and you're trying to keep your uh, equilibrium and you're trying to maintain your buoyancy and the waves are moving you, the camera's moving too. And so I want to somehow put together some decent footage that doesn't make you seasick. Um, doesn't make me seasick during the edit either. So we'll see how well that goes. But initially, I might have to put things in slow motion and just do like a second of this and a second of that. And I just haven't taken the time to try and do it. But I definitely want to. I've got a big dive trip uh, planned for 2022. And uh, when I go on that, I hope to have some nice footage as well. I hope I do a good job with it. <laughs> we will see. But yes, it will come when I can do it. Uh, Norman, thank you very much for the compliment. I appreciate that. Aaron says, how long does it take for a frag to encrust? It just depends on the type of coral, but some are a little quicker than others. Some do nothing and sit there stagnant forever. It can be really frustrating. Aaron says, how much flow or tank turnover do you have in your main reef? I don't know exactly. I'm probably pushing somewhere around 2,000 to 2,500 gallons an hour through the, the drains, maybe. But uh, And I don't even like measure the flow rates of the vortex and stuff. It's like, eh, everything's on. I just find a sweet spot and I leave it alone. I don't touch it. I'd say that the, well, the vortex have four different cycles. They go through every single day. They do reef crest, they do lagoon mode, they do nutrient export mode, and they do something else. And uh, I programmed those like two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, and I barely even glance at them until somebody asked me a question. 
and they just kind of cycle up and down and do their thing and they just keep running and that's all that matters to me. Uh, Tahoe Underground says, can you give me a link to your online store and to your online forum? So the link is milosreef.com and I'm sure Andrea or one of the others will type it in on the uh, in the chat here for you. And then the link to the uh, group on Facebook is right here. It's Club Milo's Reef, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Milo's Reef. And uh, the group, like I said, has been around for a couple of years. So you can check that out. The, uh, the shop on the website. Now, the website is not just a shop, even though that has become a big part of it in the last few years. But it's actually a massive website of information. There's like a thousand articles on there. So pretty much anything that I've ever discussed in the past is on there, either in a blog, an article, a critter ID, um, or a solution. So, or even the FAQs. So uh, there's a lot of information there for you. And uh, the new version of the website is in its final stages of production. So it should roll out sometime very soon. <laughs> it will be a Christmas miracle. Uh, we started in January. I can't believe it's almost December and here we are still working on it. But the uh, website will have some really nice new features that I hope you guys enjoy, but it's gonna really promote the selling part since that's how I pay the bills. And so I have to push the selling part. Tim says, can you recommend equipment needed such as to set up a calcium reactor? I have the apex. Can you explain what the carbon doser is and what equipment is, what equipment is critical? So the calcium reactor itself, is just a plastic tube with a pump that circulates the water in a circle and you put the media inside. You're going to need a CO2 tank. You're going to need a regulator. The regulator needs a solenoid. The solenoid opens and closes based on electricity and that would be plugged into something like a pH controller or your apex. The carbon doser is this really fancy electronic regulator that has a solenoid built in and I've been running the same one for 10 years <laughs> and it's such a nice device you don't have to see the gas go through it instead of watching and counting bubbles rising a red light flashes. So when it's on and it's sending bubbles, it does flash, 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 flash. And each bubble rep or each flash represents a bubble. And you can actually turn the dial to go from 10 bubbles per second to one bubble every 10 seconds. It can go, there's a huge range. And mine tends to be about two bubbles a second. Uh, and I've had it like that forever. And it's a really, it's expensive, but it's a great device. And like I said, mine's lasted 10 years. So I definitely got my money's worth out of it. I know they've doubled the price of that thing, if not even tripled it in recent years. I can't believe how the price keeps going up, but I still love it as a, as a tool for the reef for a calcium reactor. And like I said, the, the apex can turn it on and off. And the regular itself does the job of metering out the gas into your calcium reactor gradually based on the pH level you've chosen. The apex will be the pH level. I have a calcium reactor article on my website and then we did a video called Let's Talk About Calcium Reactors, and you could definitely watch that one because this one's a really deep topic, and you could go through that, and I think it would help you a bunch. And then, of course, BRS and these other channels have done some really good in-depth, here's how we do the exact thing. Uh, the only thing that I will tell you that I disagree with on the entire planet is that I push the water into the calcium reactor. I don't suck the water out of it. So that, that's... I don't know why anyone started that crazy idea in the first place, but now it's... It's like everything else that's debated, including which way to put the toilet paper on the roll. It's uh, just push the water in like you push water into everything. And uh, that's it. It's that simple. I use the Versa pump to push water into the reactor and have it trickle out. And uh, it's been working bulletproof ever since I set it up, I don't know, whatever that was, six, seven months ago. Before that, I had the Camor dosing pump. Before that, I had a big, huge machine that's designed for a hospital uh, uh, IV bags and before that I had a maxi jet that just had a pinch nozzle and it just forced water into the reactor so there's a lot of ways of getting water in and that's in the article on my website how are we doing on time how about we wrap up in the next 11 minutes let's stop at the two hour mark so I can go do some more things today I want to work on the tank today Alex says the LFS, the local fisher, was selling a gem tank for $500. Is that how much they're really worth? Actually, those used to be $1,500. So getting one for $500 is a great price. 
And I believe the reason that price came down on that fish, and I know you're thinking that's a lot, which it is, but it came down a lot is because I heard, I don't know if I didn't verify this, but I heard where the gem tangs were coming from before the government that governed the waters where the gem tanks came from was putting such a high tax on it. That's why we hobbyists were paying $1,500 each. And then at some point in another part of the world, they found some gem tanks without that governmental tax thrown on top. And so the price has come down for that one particular fish. The gem tang is really pretty. I've never kept one, but uh, I'd like to. <laughs> they basically look like a tang covered in ick but the ick is a perfect pattern so that you can say, look, it's on both sides, it's perfect. But no, they're really pretty. And uh, they are not aggressive and they may even be bullied. So you have to keep in mind what other fish you have in the tank. Because like my friend Tammy has two and she had to put one down in her refugium of her, the big sump I built her to keep it safe because the other fish were attacking it, which is crazy. Um, Brian Reese says, how much is it of a concern for corals and invertebrates to bring in a fish parasite in a reef system? It seems inconsistent with the fish parasite's life cycle. Well, normally the corals and the uh, invertebrates are all in separate tanks away from the fish. Sometimes you'll see some coral systems with a fish in it or, so, or two, but you can look in that tank when you're buying the corals and see if the fish looks healthy. I remember I went to a, tray, uh, to a frag swap years ago, and this guy had the end cap of, you know, like three tanks. And he had all these corals for sale and he had the most sick yellow tang in there, covered in ick, starving to death. It just was just a dilapidated yellow tang. I felt so bad for that fish. And I thought there is no way I'm buying anything from this guy. If that fish looks like that, why would he bring it to the show? And it just, it looked so unhealthy that I thought anything else in that tank must be unhealthy too. I wouldn't take the chance. So if you're going somewhere to buy corals and there's no fish in the tank, it's because it's a coral only system. You're not gonna have to worry about fish parasites. And usually the invertebrates, the snails, the hermits, the shrimp, the emerald crabs, they're all sitting in separate tanks that have nothing to do with corals or fish. They're their own standalone system. So, and those guys clean themselves. They pick everything off their shelves. That's why they look so pristine. When you buy them, they don't look like they're covered in algae, right? They're not covered in anything. And we take them and we put them straight from the bag. We acclimate and put them right in our tank. And I've never seen anything show up in my tank. And I've added thousands of cleanup crew to my tank over the years. And I've never seen some weird, crazy outbreak on my fish or even on my corals from adding cleanup crew. So I don't dip or do anything with those. I just put them in the tank. I will inspect them. And if I see something concerns me, I can scrape it off. But almost they're almost pristine. I just don't see any problems. Uh, PPS says, how do you keep your sand bed so clean? Do you ever vacuum? How often? Do you ever change out parts of the sand bed? So the sand bed behind me is seven years old and this tank has never been vacuumed. This one little spot down here, let me change cameras. This one spot here gets a little bit of a shift from that power head. It kind of pushes some flow and creates a depression and I scoop it back a little bit occasionally, but I never vacuum it or work on it. The rest of it is about to be addressed now. So later today, the two of us are gonna work on cleaning the sand bed for the first time in forever. <laughs> and we're just gonna siphon and clean and change a whole bunch of water and get the tank looking nice again. And that'll be, uh, it'll look really good for the seven year anniversary video. Uh, Caitlin Array did the anemone cube the other day and that sand looks beautiful, but no, I don't touch my sand bed, I leave it alone. The other thing I like to have for a sand bed is a cucumber or two. And I have a whole bunch of tiger tail cucumbers in my tank that uh, come out and they eat the sand and they poop out clean sand. It's a great system, but no, I don't do anything with it. I leave it alone and it just takes care of itself. And like I said, if you have a lot of critters crawling across it, or if you happen to have a cold tang, you'll see they grab a mouthful and they kind of nibble stuff off the surface. All those little bits, everyone's doing a little bit to keep the sand nice and clean. Um, Chef Kuma Yoke said that the ATI ICP test came back with that 539 milligram per liter. I don't know what the, why they're using that number, and I don't know what the equivalent is, but um, if you own a nitrate test kit, you should just use that and not worry about what the ATI. I mean, it's great. The ATI test kit gave you some information. So now if you have an API kit or if you have a, nit a salifer kit or an ELOS kit, you can actually measure and find out what your nitrates are. 
And if they're 20 or if they're 40 or if they're 100, you can deal with it according, like I said, with big water changes and bring them right back down. But that number is a weird one. I, it's the first time I've seen that. Uh, Paul Biggs, thank you very much for the super chat. He says, the bubble tip anemone is removed and put in its own tank looks sick following a war with a Caribbean anemone. Not feeding or opening fully, losing color. Do you have any ideas? Well, <laughs> you, you've been combining these anemones for some time now and hoping it would work out. Since you've got them separated into separate tanks now, that's a good start. Um, be, cautious, be judicious with your lighting for now. The anemone needs some light. It doesn't need tons. I would make sure the light's not too close to the water. I'd make sure the light's not running too long. I'd make sure it's not running too intensely. You could have a light cycle of seven hours a day, eight hours, nine hours a day, running maybe 60 to 80 percent. Bubble tips don't need crazy high bright light like some think. So, and your lights may be too close to the water. You have to lift them up off the water another six inches to get them away so that the anemone can open and not feel crazy stressed out. But, um, when you say not feeding, I don't know what you're trying to feed it, but if you are trying to feed it anything, I like to feed it a very small bit of meaty food. So like if you went to the store and you bought a raw shrimp from the deli, it's got the, the shell, you peel that off, and you cut that raw shrimp into five pieces, and they're, each piece is about the size of a lima bean. I would try to put one piece on the anemone and hopefully it'll eat that little tiny piece of meat, um, and you do that once every three to five days, and it can regain some of its health and maybe it can perk up and get better. Um, but if you're trying to do silver sides, or I don't even do that. Just I recommend little tiny foods. The anemone cube gets nothing but a few krill that happen to get in there when I'm pouring in some food, and the clowns bring it to them. They get some of the mysis that goes in that tank. They get some flake food. They get some benarif. That's all they get. They, I'm not actually feeding them anything, and I have a tank full of tentacles, which you saw in the video earlier. So I would just try a little bit of food. I would try to leave it alone. I would try not to hit it with too much flow, and I would avoid using too much light on it while it's trying to recover. Uh, PPS says, you also talked about the flipper magnets a few weeks ago. You said you changed the blade every time you used it. Why is that? If you rinse it really well, it's, will it already have, uh, will it already start to rust? What can happen if you use the blade? That has some rust. All right, so first of all, we're talking about different things. Let me turn off that thing about uh, Miller's Reef. And I'll throw this up there just for a subliminal message. <laughs> um, I use the mag float with something called the... I'm trying to remember what it's called. It's this piece that I glue on that holds a razor blade. And anytime I use that razor blade, that one is removed, I rinse it down, I wipe it down with, with oil, like cooking oil, and I wrap it on a paper towel and I clip it and I throw it in the basket. And then that way it stays protected from rusting. And then when I want to use the other side of that blade, because it's a double-sided blade, I will just flip the blade upside down. And I can tell because the blade has the word handy on it. So when I first use it, that word handy is readable. And then the next time I use it, I turn it upside down and handy is upside down. And now I know that side is the brand new, never used before edge. And I can scrape my glass clean and get off all the algae that's stubborn that didn't come off with a normal cleaning magnet. That is something completely different from the flipper. The flipper has its own metal blade that should, in theory, stay nice and good for a very long time. It could be left underwater. It could be removed from the water. That's your choice. And uh, I don't use this one on my tank. I use the actual razor blade for my own system. I've been doing forever, probably 15 years. And I'm glad that I can still get blades. One day they'll be gone and I'll have to use something like this. But uh, for me, I found that the razor blade is more gentle on the Starfire glass, which I don't want to scratch this tank. Like I said, this tank is turning seven. It has a few scratches, but it's not like a nightmare of scratches, thank goodness, because I'm that meticulous about keeping metal off the glass as much as possible. Most of the time, I'm cleaning it with a credit card or just use my regular wooden cleaning magnet and I'll just go back and forth and just clean the glass. And I love this one. This is called Algae Float. And that one is the 
Tiger Shark, which is probably their, one of their biggest ones. It's designed for one inch glass. Uh, they have the Piranha, which is for a smaller glass. They've got the Hammerhead, which is a medium size. And then they have the Shrimp, which is a little tiny one. It's really adorable. It's great for little tiny tanks, but if it separates, the shrimp sinks to the bottom, where all the other ones, they float up and you can pick it off the surface and put it back onto the other half. Um, but these, they, you don't, they'll last. So, and then when you need to, you can replace them. Just pull this off and snap a new one on just by a replacement blade. But uh, I was talking about something entirely different. I can't remember what it's called. I've had it forever. <laughs> Sorry. All right. <laughs> Eric, thank you very much for the super chat. He said, this is for Caitlin. Send Mark another cue card. <laughs> That's great. Um... Tim says, I'm starting to have success with SPS, and I credit you with all that I've learned. I can cut some frags, and acros are growing. That's great, Tim. That's how it's supposed to be, and that should be for all of you. So thanks for letting me know that. I appreciate it. Uh, the camera filter you're looking for is going to be the Polyp Lab Coral View Lens. Um, you can type it in Google. You can type Coral View Lens Milos Reef, and it'll take you right to it. Um, and it's in the dry goods section of the shop. That's what I'm looking forward to the new shop, the new website, because then we will be able to actually type in the brand and find everything from Flipper, find everything from Blue Life USA, find everything from Salaford, find everything from Elos, find everything from Prodibio in one cluster, and you won't have to go through pages of dry goods trying to find a certain thing. So that will be really exciting when that works. Well, my back is getting really tired, guys, so I think I'm going to wrap up here. I'm just trying to see if there's any last questions. There's a lot of conversations here. But um, Cordell said, I'm going to talk about this one because I mentioned it before. Sand sifting starfish, some say they're reef safe. What are your thoughts? They are not reef safe at all. They destroy your sand bed. And they eat everything in there until you have a dead sand bed. And we don't want dead sand beds because that's what leads to problems in the sand such as diatoms, dinoflagellates, cyanobacteria. The sand sifting starfish has a very specific diet. It eats all the bacteria, where the serpent starfish eats detritus. They have totally different uh, diets, and sand sifters cause problems. Now, you will always have people, including on this channel, they'll say, hey, I've had them for 10 years. I never had a problem. I'm happy for that person, but for the average hobbyist, that does no good for their tank, and I don't recommend it. And if you go into a fish store and you see someone buying one, if you happen to be like me and you say, are you buying that for a reef tank? And they're like, well, yeah. Then the store, store employee very often will say, oh, you can't have this for a reef tank. This is for a fish only. And they quickly take it away because <laughs> they know it doesn't belong in a reef tank. But people think it's good because it turns over the sand and it's constantly moving and it's so active. It's a bad choice for a reef tank and I do not recommend it and I tell people not to do it. And uh, that's just my opinion. But, you know, you're going to do what you want to do. I just don't think it's a good choice. Um, Rajair says, how do you keep your beard in such nice shape? What trimmer do you use? Uh, funny story. Uh, this is my first beard ever. And I know nothing. And I've had help from Caitlin telling me what to get. <laughs> and I talked to my friend Ian, too. And he recommended uh, a type of trimmer that was on uh, Amazon. And I worked on it last weekend and did my best. And then uh, Caitlin kind of cleaned up what I couldn't see. And, uh, so it was teamwork. That's why it looks so good. And it's something that I have to do every couple of weeks, apparently. So I will work on this for a while. And we'll see how long this lasts. But for now, I like it. She likes it. And so I'm moving on with my life with it. So <laughs> thanks for asking. Um, but it's just a, a kit from Amazon. It, had, it was like 60 bucks, and it had like 23 pieces in it. And it's a wall clipper. Pickle Boy says, I want to get a Dragonette next year. What do I need to keep one healthy and happy? Um, an established tank would be really good, and your tank being a year old should be better. You probably need more rock in your tank. I think I've seen your tank in Club Miller's Reef, and it needs more rock work. There has to be a lot of rock, because that way a lot of pods can live in the rock, 
and the mandarin can work its way around the reef and find pods to snack on. And uh, maybe you'll get lucky and it will also like other foods that are prepared, but that's not a guarantee. Uh, Maria says, I'm trying to pick a centerpiece from our 70 gallon tank. I was trying to stay away from a bubble tip anemone. I don't want anything that could possibly have acrid eating flatworms. My little corals have uh, finally started growing. That's great. Um, a centerpiece coral could be something that you like the shape of or the color of. And uh, obviously it needs to be big to be a centerpiece. So you may like blastos, for example. They're really, really pretty. It's in the LPS family. They don't bring in pests and they come in several different colors. Uh, Duncans are very popular. Acans are very beautiful. What about that thing? <laughs> about that thing? <laughs> That's an acan, yeah. So there's acans can be uh, a nice big colony, but they take years to get large. This is a chalice coral. It's pretty much the centerpiece in my tank. And uh, this is a cactus pavona, which is basically the other centerpiece. <laughs> and then the sea bathe. I mean, these three things are a huge part of the middle of the reef. And then you got the shadow caster, which is the acropora on top. So these are just some, you know, you just find something you really like and move it to the middle. It could be something as simple as a frog spawn colony or some kind of gorgeous torch colony. There's a lot of choices for a 70 gallon. You're not really limited on what you can put. It's just, you have to realize whatever it is, it's going to get bigger over time and eventually it may get too big. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Maria, for the super chat. That is my last question for today. I want to remind you guys today is water test Saturday. Please do test your water. I tested my water yesterday. I did all my work already, but I am going to test my nitrate tonight after the big cleanup. And I'm going to test phosphate here after the live stream because I want to see where it went down after treating last night with phosphate or X. Um, the reason you test your water is because it saves lives. So please don't be lazy. Please do make the effort to test your water. It's your tank is not fine. You don't know the real numbers until you know the numbers. So use your test kits. They do expire. They do go bad. So you're supposed to use them every single week until they're empty and then get brand new ones again and do it all over again. Um, if, other than that, I'll see you guys on Club Milo's Reef. Thank you if you shop from Milo's Reef and buy things. That helps pay the bills. And I will see you next Saturday right here at 2 o'clock Central Time. Bye.